Berkeley's Sproul Plaza, February 2017. Protesters rampage against a speech by Milo Yiannopoulos, a conservative provocateur. In this exact location, in 1964, it was progressive students who were trying to exercise their right to free speech. For this week's episode of Moving Upstream, we went around the country to find out why, these days, some students would like to see limits to free speech. Free speech is not hate speech. It's not speech that's meant to harm and to deteriorate communities. On our recent trip to Berkeley, it soon became clear that these days, three factors are fueling the free speech debate. You could call them the three P's, polarization, postmodernism, and provocation. We start with polarization. Is there something different about students today? Absolutely. Versus Absolutely. 10 years ago, 20, yep. 50 years ago? Yep. What's different? Students today are just not tolerant of opposing points of view. It's hard to sell them on opposing points of view because it makes them angry or uncomfortable. This is journalism professor Bill Drummond, we spoke to him in September on what was supposed to be the first day of what Milo Yiannopoulos trumpeted as Free Speech Week. This is what UC Berkeley has left us with, but it was very important that we show up on campus. Drummond was himself a student here when the campus gave birth to the free speech movement. I was an undergraduate. What was involved was car tables, soliciting people to go to Mississippi to register people to vote. And that was against the rules. Protesters fought the administration. University officials relented nationwide, allowing student political activities on campus. That paved the way, a few years later, for waves of student protests against the war in Vietnam. Drummond is among the liberal professors who are now speaking out against students that are intolerant to opposing views. He tells me that students are arriving at Berkeley more polarized than any time since the late 60s. We're asking, we're asking the people to know you're, you're forcing. They're coming from a lot of preconceived notions based on their identity group. There are certain things that will make them very uncomfortable and they will stop listening and they will rebel. Across the U.S., over the last few years especially, the number of freshmen identifying as moderates has dwindled, fueling extremes on both sides. They're rebelling against their campuses, playing host to speakers they find abhorrent. Since the beginning of the presidential campaign, there have been 25 incidents of speakers being blocked on U.S. campuses due to pressure from the left compared with four speakers blocked due to pressure from the right. Cal anti-fascist. Some of these speakers who want to come to campus, yeah. they don't call themselves fascists. Do you call them fascists? I mean, depends who you're talking about. I think they've- Milo, Steve Their Bannon. goal is to build power for the nationalist right. Whether you agree with him or not, Steve Bannon, he served at the highest level of government. I think it'd be interesting to hear him speak on campus to challenge his ideas. Like, do you think we could convince him of a different set of ideas? Maybe not, but you could at least hear what he has to say. I think everyone's already heard what he has to say. So, uh, for example, Breitbart News, they represent a very distinct and clear break from classical conservatism. It's really about singling out certain groups to target and repress. The list of speakers who've been shut down due to pressure from progressives includes Texas Republican Senator John Cornyn, former CIA director John Brennan, an Obama appointee, and conservative political commentator Ben Shapiro. Berkeley says security for Shapiro's event cost $600,000. You can't have unfettered uh, free speech. Drummond thinks administrators might need to reclaim restrictive powers they surrender to students in the 60s and halt events for any political speakers, no matter whose side they're on. 
That brings us to the second factor, postmodernism. Postmodernists view knowledge as the product of a centuries-long struggle between different groups in society. According to them, white males have long enjoyed the privilege of being the dominant group. Thus, perhaps unwittingly, they've defined knowledge in ways that justify and perpetuate their elite status. How would you frame what's happening right now? It is a fight between intellectual descendants of the Enlightenment and postmodernists that view the Enlightenment as a story about European superiority. Professor Brett Weinstein, formerly of Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, defines himself as a progressive. Yes. And you even supported Bernie Sanders in the I last did. election. Earlier this year, his class on evolutionary biology was interrupted by protesters after he denounced the school's annual Day of Absence. You said some racist shit. Can you I did apologize? Not. I did yes, not. Okay. Minority students have a tradition of removing themselves from campus on this one day each year in order, through their absence, to make a statement about their importance on campus and society. Last year, they changed tack and asked white people to leave. Which uh, I find unacceptable as, as a person. I should also probably say as a Jew. I, when people start telling me where I can and cannot be, uh, it rings alarm bells. Resign. Resign. <laughs> OK. And later, he did. Weinstein's among a host of scholars who are connecting the dots between postmodernism and today's free speech controversies. I find myself under attack because liberty is not a high value amongst those who are at the moment driving the quest for what they call social justice. Postmodernism emphasizes the value of the lived experiences of traditionally oppressed groups. Professors are saying, you have every right to say, my experience isn't represented, it isn't captured, and it contradicts everything you're saying. Professor Ehrlich Baer thinks this is a good thing. Marcus Aurelius said, when people protest, most often it concerns something else. They're saying something isn't quite working for us in this society. Most of these cases are really about race. And when they're about immigration, there's an impatience in the student's part to say, we don't have to put up with this again because it's something that has been settled. Immigration, that's not been settled. Absolutely not. You're completely right. So this is one that's not been settled. It touches on America's fundamental commitment to racial equality. Which brings us to provocation. Students are being mocked on their own turf by the people who epitomize what they're against. Take white nationalist Richard Spencer. Do you not want to hear something? Do you not want to hear something, poor little babies? Oh. And former Breitbart editor Milo Yiannopoulos. Feminism is a mean, vindictive, spiteful, nasty, man-hating philosophy. A transgender campaigner's way of saying, if you don't want to have sex with me, you're transphobic. You're a provocateur. That's your brand. That's what you do. Ridicule is the most powerful thing in your arsenal as a cultural warrior. Wrap the truth in a good joke. You're unbeatable. It seems to me that we're living in a golden era of free speech. You've got your, you've got, what, two million followers on Facebook? You're able to reach whomever you want to reach. It simply isn't true that most private citizens could express themselves like I do or like Donald Trump does and survive. You cannot speak like I speak and hold down a job if you work for the government or in the media or in a university. We're talking about people who are using this issue to deliberately provoke which can be an instructive pedagogical tool, but they're also people who come in just to sell books. I'm not here to be threatened. Who's threatening you? I think the alt-right is threatening us. I think the administration is complicit. One of the conditions under which free speech is not acceptable is if it disrupts the environment that is supposed to be protected, which is educational. 
the history here is that the free speech movement actually just did disrupt classes when people were protesting the Vietnam War. I think if you're disrupting a space in order to make it more inclusive, I think that that is necessary. If you're disrupting a space in order to advocate dehumanization, I don't think that's the same at all. The First Amendment does not give you the right to speak anywhere in any public institution that you choose. Bayer thinks it is time for new rules on who is allowed to speak on campus. On the one hand, we have a firebrand provocateur. On the other hand, we have oversensitive students. Neither one is totally genuine, maybe, so it's the role of the administration to negotiate that. More than half of U.S. states have either passed or are considering legislation that would require state universities to protect free speech. Thanks for watching this episode of Moving Upstream. I'm Jason Bellini. We look forward to seeing your comments.